It's been a great thing to come be back at Bielefeld. I, some of you know I've been here quite a few times. I feel like it might even be six times. Um, and uh, that has to say something very good about it and really about you all because it's been the intellectual companionship and knowledge making that's been exciting for us over and over. I come, great conversations, same on the other side. I learn a lot. I get in fights with everyone, intellectual fights, and then in the end we all make up again. And even this week I've had conversations that have really made me uh, advance things and doubt much of what I'm about to <laughs> say to you. Um, so uh, I will just start in reading it and I hope I'll be able to stay in time for, for that. Um, so, time tense and change in British, and I should really say British Isles historiography, I may make a remark about that later, from Bede to Peter Brown. Um, time is certainly in the historical news these days, and Bielefeld, as in a surprising number of things, is near the center of that activity. The pages of journals interested in the problems of historiography and its theory are bursting with reflections on reconfigurations of time. It is about 15 years ago that some of us in Connecticut, sitting around a table in a pub, coined the phrase the new metaphysics of time to gesture at some of the interests that had grown up, not least because of the ramifying ideas of Kozelik. Uh, the worries of Hartog have now been joined by the worries of Chakrabarti and Anthropocene, and they pushed some of the temporality of presence to the side. But historical futures and complex temporalities remain the name of the game. I turn to time myself these days from a somewhat different agenda, but one that I hope might help in some diagnoses. I am motivated by some philosophical questions about the character of historiography that for the sake of focus I will leave to the side, but this made me wonder what historians do with time in their work and what sort of options and angles are available for managing and deploying it. The working group here at Bielefeld's Theory Center on Time as an Argument came along at just the right moment to encourage me to start thinking a bit about the various places of time within the practice of historiography. I am thankful to them and to Franz and Lisa for inviting me, of course, and very thankful to all of you here for giving me a chance to take first steps, really, in trying to understand this topic or think about it. Uh, I should say I am, this is not um, a demonstration of time as an argument. I think it contributes to my own understanding of it, but that's not the framework. The framework is, is time uh, among historians. Now, everything you're about to hear, as I say, is very preliminary and quite loosely anchored. It is an attempt to describe some commonalities in historiographical practice and writing. The title I circulated is fairly misleading by now. I will ignore, for the most part, the rich and complex work being done on time theoretically and look for clues and ideas from within the historiographical practice and at least some of its texts. In the end, I do want to know how historians have used time to create history's meanings. Dealing with time, most traditionally the past, is what historians are often thought to be experts in. Aristotle opined on history's particularity compared to the higher activities of philosophy and drama, but he also said, and I quote, the true difference is that history relates what has happened, poetry what may happen. History has some special business with the past, so it seems, but today we are more sensitive to the fact it might have a special relationship, not just uh, with the past, but with time itself in all its directions. The goal, therefore, is merely to notice some of historians' management of time and to suggest some hypotheses about how it all works. My tentative conclusions, boy, are they tentative, move me into the area where multiple temporalities, no surprise, appear as the normal core of historical work. Uh, you deserve many warnings about this talk. My approach has some perversities, and I want to explain or contextualize what motivates me a bit so that if we might so that we might, if I'm lucky, agree in less than an hour's time that there was something like method in my folly. Still, you should brace yourselves. This is a guilty talk and it is forged in sin, and I want to alert you to at least three of its vice-ridden elements. The talk will be unprofessional, unhistorical, and selfish. Uh, the talk is unprofessional, not just because of the frivolous and dilettantish tone I adopt, but because I am to a notable degree going to think with a diverse group of historians who were not really at the core of disciplinary history. Certainly weren't. You will hear me drawing from four historians a bit, 
Only one was ever a history professor, and even he has some peculiarities as such. He holds no PhD, but has built a career, as it were, from his undergraduate education. This is Peter Brown. Two of our authors were devoted historians, but worked for a popular reading public and wrote and thought across diverse genres with strong political and ethical aims. These are Catherine Macaulay, um, and who published in the second half of the 18th century, sort of, and Thomas Carlyle, something of a wild man and one of the best known intellectuals of his 19th century day. Finally, the one who is probably closest to our academic modality and careful intensity was the 8th century monk Bede. I think Bede and Carlyle would be most likely to thrive in the atmosphere of Bielefeld with its combination of deep thinking, theoretical openness, and discipline as well. I don't know what you'd make of them. The way I'm going to treat them and my topic is also culpable for being unhistorical. While I'm using these texts for inspiration, which might itself be questionable historical procedure, I am not planning to treat them in or of their times, not historically, but rather mainly as quarries for sentences. At any event, having read them together, I hope to elicit help from them as to what, I'm sorry, hope, help from them as to what historians might have done and might do with time in as many modalities and possibilities as I have time to consider and space to write. Aside from tiny introductions, I won't give you much context and will be looking more for types than causes, and I will pay little attention or reverence to order of time. My motivation is more theoretical and historiographical. In a way, it doesn't matter to what I'm, going, I'm doing, who wrote these works or when, just that they are generally, his, generically history. Having said which, all the works upon which I focused were notably successful history books, critically acclaimed and finding good audiences. The last vice, that is declared vice, is selfishness. I'm reading these four historians mainly because I have wanted to spend more time with them. Bede from a sort of nostalgia for my start in medieval history, Carlyle to return to the exhilaration of a strange and stylistically Baroque historian, Peter Brown because I have so often been inspired by him and hope to pay him some, more, uh, some deeper attention, and Catherine Macaulay because I had wanted to read more than just a few pages of her since I was about 20 years old but never had. Now, to make a virtue of such vices means finding something worthwhile here to illuminate a topic oddly straightforward, the way historians handle time. The only other point of mitigation is to say that it is probably useful for theorists and philosophers of history to read more historiography as they develop their views, which is not always the case. Uh, to give you a sense of my plan and especially um, uh, we, as, who knows how far I'll get to, through this plan. I'll just give you uh, kind of the parts of it, uh, which you can see there. We'll have the introduction, disorientation, which you're currently experiencing, texts and authors. Then we'll go and look at tenses, mainly through the present. At least that's where I start. Uh, then uh, a section on timeless claims and generalizations. Uh, then a section on temporal ontology and quanta. Um, and then counting time and making periods and parts that I meant to write further won't exist, so they'll be in the conclusion uh, in the play of times. So as you can probably tell from this, the big thing that happened was I didn't proceed through the t each author. I decided to proceed thematically, and that yeah, changed a lot of what you're going to experience. All right, so um, very uh, very little uh, introductions. So here's a, it's not really a bit of bead because it's a cast of the top of his head, but um, I felt increasingly like it's good to give medieval representation some bit of them, and we have a lot of bits of them we can sometimes show. So Bede uh, is an English, North English uh, historian and monk, um, theologian, um, great writer of saints' lives, uh, and wrote one of the most important and durable histories of the Middle Ages, even if nobody knows about it, uh, the ecclesiastical history of the uh, English people. Uh, he also wrote books, though, on time, and I'll mention that his, his impact on figuring out the calendar is actually one of the most important kind of uh, intellectual developments for the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages and after. Um, 
And he died in what we call 735, but the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which I have a bit of there, puts in 734. Uh, then uh, Peter Brown, the only thing I really want to say here is that when I produced the topic, I wasn't quite sure what his nationality was, um, but he's Irish, or at least Irish born. I think he would probably have preferred me to have written British Isles then rather than British, but he's been in the United States for a long time and a great historian of uh, late antiquity, the topic that I'll be looking at. And maybe all I want to say here is uh, I'm only looking at one book of his, The World of Late Antiquity. So there's lots of others, and he actually read more of them, but that's all I focused on. Um, and again, you'll only get a little bit of it anyway. Uh, Thomas Carlyle, uh, the one I suppose people are most likely to have heard of, but I don't know. Um, uh, the Sage of Chelsea, so a great uh, strange figure personally, the more you know about him, the less you like him, and, uh, but works that were very important and influential in the uh, middle of the 19th century and later. Um, much of them history books, but with a style and intensity that makes them quite difficult for us to enjoy or to teach or to approach now, but crucial in his time. And uh, again, history itself was very uh, important to him. Um, he wrote the, uh, lots, but the ones I was looking at are the, the books on Frederick II of Prussia and um, the French Revolution. Okay. And lastly, um, uh, Catherine Macaulay, who dies in 1791, I think she was about 60 at that point, um, an absolutely extraordinary person I don't know enough about, but wrote a five or seven volume, depending on how you count it, History of England which is the text I was looking at. She also wrote an epistolary history of England, multi-volume, which I'm fascinated by as an idea, but I haven't looked at it yet. Um, and she was very popular. Her work was really significant. It, it was um, a kind of a radical Whig answer to David Hume's account, so it, it fed, fed right into the politics of the day. She also wrote um, kind of against Burke, uh, his response to the French Revolution was her last work. She wrote uh, in favor of the American Revolution, writing to Boston after the, ma the Boston Massacre, giving them sympathy and so on. So she was really quite interesting as a radical figure uh, in the kind of Whiggish uh, extreme, you know, left wing of the Whig group in the period. Okay, so uh, interesting people. I'm not really going to tell you anything hardly useful about, uh, or, and you're not going to get a good sense for their works at all, uh, because as I say, this, I'm really working up from the level of sentences for the most part in this, uh, in this piece. Okay, so now I start on the area where I've looked at tenses first. So if we peel back the onion of conceptualizations of time, I wonder whether it might disappear into the basic grammar of linguistic time. In other words, the capacity for rendering historical time or temporality works with and around a particular language's way of doing certain jobs. It seemed, therefore, an interesting question to ask how dependent our grand concepts of historical time are on the small operations of grammar. I was asked many years ago by a sociologist who was venturing into historical work, how come historians are so attached to the use of the past tense? I took that to be self-evident before the question, but have since also noticed how one of the persistent jobs one undertakes in, making, in marking student essays for improvement is to correct them into the past tense. Right? And so suddenly I realized because of this question, like, whoa, that's, look, that's whoa, <laughs> it's a choice. This raises the thought that I could correct them into the present tense, even when writing history. So this probably aligns with the fact that grammatical tense is not the only way, of course, to represent time. Um, Chinese as well as Hebrew, two languages that have arguably generated very notable historiographical traditions, different points in time, don't use those forms, don't have them. We all know that in learning other languages and their tenses, the difference between perfect and imperfect past actions um, is probably crucial and central to understanding those, and that relationship seems to be quite important in the way historians uh, manage uh, tense and time themselves. The completed action and the incomplete action point at some of the same ontological concerns. 
There is, of course, one important point that much of historiography appears to deal with completed and enduring entities, ideas, and institutions as much as actions and events. And those, uh, I think, are, well, introduce a lot of complicated uh, factors. Well, tense is not an option in uh, English history, but already we can see that alongside tense are other relational terms that work indexically or relationally to organize things temporally. They matter in tense historical work too. I might as well introduce them now, for they can occur in the present tense as well. And these are just prepositions, adverbs, and adjectives that do temporal jobs. Um, and of course, things like uh, before, after, when, near, in, far, at, or on, and others. So we say, I see her on Wednesdays, and we do a certain time thing there, or I see her routinely on Wednesdays, um, now I see her, or I see her then. You know, you add little terms in and they kind of start deploying something. Well, the use of the present tense is rare in history, uh, historiography, marking a time past as present is more common. Temporal modifiers do related jobs, as when Macaulay writes, and I quote here, that Buckingham now enjoyed his favor to a height of extreme dotage, she says. In Bede's history, he very commonly introduces new sections with a phrase such as, at about this time, the West Saxons received the faith of Christ, or now Paulinus had left the church, or very soon Bishop Yadbert was attacked by a disease. Articulation of sense, but also of time, is performed by these little temporal modifiers. Without question, tenses other than past ones have generally very little place in historiography. The future tense is probably the least used, and the present tense is, of course, more frequently met with, but makes up a tiny proportion of these historical texts. There are, of course, um, um, self-centered uh, reflections like that arrive in the preface and the conclusion, and there they tend to have the present tense used. All of these four authors use the present tense at the beginning, kind of the end of the books. Um, when Catherine Macaulay wrote of the relationship, however, when Catherine Macaulay wrote of the relationship between James the Sixth and First and the Dutch in 1609, she writes, in the beginning of the treaty, his offers to the Dutch estates were high and warm. Now, she could have said, are high and warm, and there would be no cognitive loss, right? So if you go through, you can substitute lots of sentences, and you sort of then have to ask yourself, so what's at play? This becomes a bit of a negative then uh, conversation. Not using the present does seem important beyond convention. It is part of the character of the imperfect tense in English that it can cheat the issue. Actions clearly completed are rendered as incomplete for the very purpose of taking some steps towards the immediacy <coughs> of the present tense without that full commitment that tends to involve the reader, if not the writer in the action. So in the, when you use the imperfect past as well, you keep the game, the action going um, as, as much as almost as the present tense. Okay. Now, uh, Carlyle is quite unusual in his willingness to grab hold and use the present tense. At the beginning of his five-volume history of Frederick, he writes, and I quote, Friedrich of Brandenburg Hohenzollern, who came by course of natural succession to be Friedrich II of Prussia, and is known in these ages as Frederick the Great, was born in the palace of Berlin. His father, they say, was like to have stifled him with caresses, so overjoyed was the man. If heaven will but please to grant it length of life. Okay. Here Carlyle does several things with these touches of the non-past. He thinks through the consciousness of the people he describes, the use of imperfect, conditional, and subjunctive tenses and moods opens up many avenues between times past and the reader's present. His emotional hope is meant to ride on the sense of Frederick William's thoughts. And of course, that conditional address to heaven comes with the subjunctive feeling and the future aspect. This has followed already two present tense interjections, um, one to refer to the current standing of Frederick and the other to point at sources almost without, with a sense of hearsay. 
they said, he says they say, but they said could have as easily worked as, the, as they say. But Carlyle's colloquial flourish dynamizes and vivifies. The tendency was even more sharply deployed in Carlyle's history of the French Revolution. In the chapter called The Feast of Pikes, dedicated to the impotence of the Bourbon family under lavish unofficial house arrest in the Tuileries, he writes, and I quote, for his French majesty, meanwhile, one of the worst things is that he can get no hunting. Alas, no hunting henceforth, only a fatal being hunted. Scarcely in the next June weeks shall he taste again the joys of the game destroyer. He sends for his smith tools, gives, in the course of the day, a few strokes of the file, quelques coups de lime. Carlyle was adept and energetic in the management of historical times through tense and mood. Bede provides another use of the present tense, easily recognized as common when he refers to the construction of the defensive walls across North Britain to repel invasion. He comments, and I quote, they built many miles of it, this is Hadrian's Wall, uh, many miles of it between the two channels. The clearest traces of the work constructed there in the form of a very wide and high wall can be seen to this day. It starts, so he's switched his tense, almost two miles west of the monastery at Abercornig. It stretches westward as far as Alcluis. Okay, end of quotation. So the effect here is to validate information, so it is evidentiary, but also to establish longevity. The present tense here does not work to shorten and make only immediate, but to lengthen time from the distant past to the current moment. It is almost in this mode a chronological use of the present as a signpost for the past, two ends of a ruler. Moreover, it is a thing you could see for yourself, even though the action of the wall's building is long gone. This playing with the present is a clue to much of historical work in its interaction or coexistence with other times operating at the same moment. In all these examples, multiple times are brought more sharply into view because the present attributed is to a present past. Now, Peter Brown generally eschews the present tense during narration, but the power of quotation brings that temporal proximity close sometimes. And this, again, it's not just Brown. Quotation often brings some uh, both immediacy, but sometimes explicitly present tense. Uh, he writes um, of one fifth century figure who was facing the perils of the desert and said, what place would God have in a savage world? Okay, so very small, small point. However, Brown's world of late antiquity is copiously illustrated, and it seems these images, uh, working in a linguistic framework, um, sorry, illustrating these working linguistic framework have exactly the tendency of playing with time through their cozying up to the past, present, and immediate, regardless sometimes of the dates being listed. So Brown sometimes includes hermeneutic captions, as he does here. Uh, so um, it says on the side, which you probably can't read, the star, he's calling this guy a star, comparing him to, um, I think, uh, like a rock star more than anything. St. Simeon stylites from the Greek stylos pillar, squatting on his pillar. He had outfaced the devil as a great snake, you see there. Clients would consult him by climbing up the ladder on the left. Mementos such as this one, the first Christian icons, spread the fame of Simeon as far afield as Persia, Rome, and Paris. Gold plaque from a 6th century Syrian reliquary. Now, as Wittgenstein said provocatively, we don't speak of past, present, and future images. So there's something about images that brings things into a kind of a present, which is what I'm saying. The images signify the immediacy of their presence, regardless of their uh, temporal associations. In using them, we can present the past. No ob obvious harm to logic would be done by the use of the present tense in many situations. 
However, in any reported situation, from physics reports to novels to legal testimony and ethnographic accounts, we prefer the past tense. It is the tense of knowing best and of considered knowledge. The present is a thin and parched thing, and its tense is more important in language learning and baby talk than in adult reflection. The dominance of the past is a feature of the present and of the language, narration, and description as well. In historiography, the use of the present tense is, as it's seen with Carlyle, a strong rhetorical move to heighten the unknown future that is encompassed by the past as it occurs in most historical uses, or to provide a sort of great continuity and proof of past action, as we saw with Bede in extending to the use of physical remains and the magic of present images. There might be many ways to heighten this effect if we were interested, as some are, in bringing the past back as feeling immediate. All right, so next section, which at least we'll get there. Uh, so this is timeless claims and generalizations. <laughs> On the other side of the use of the present tense is the place of the permanent, endless, and timeless claim. Grammatical tense clearly amounts to less than one might suppose on its own, but works with many other modes of thinking and writing to shape history. There is a dynamism in writing about time that seems anchored in the variety of temporal associations that can be drawn upon. What can go unnoticed, however, is that there is a variety of timelessness that infects historical representation and probably reality as well. Some of you will have heard me recently try to advance a strong version of this and claim that all determinant factual claims or assumptions are in their asserted truthfulness eternal, <laughs> I can't get to the sentence believing it, eternal or timeless. Thus, when Bede tells us that Emperor Claudius undertook the invasion of Britain in the year of Rome 798 is, is an utterance for all time, even though the proposition is meant to be about a specific point in time and a specific event. The truth of the claim takes it into timelessness, if it's true. There are many things we could say about it as a bit of historical prose, but the truth of it intended by the author is timeless. When Peter Brown wrote of fifth century Constantinople, and I quote, the emperors insisted that diplomacy, being as important as warfare, should cost as much. He hopes and intends that the claim is true and true forever. Uh, and if it's true, it's true forever, is my <laughs> claim. This is the case with all propositions that articulate a determinate state of affairs whenever they are uttered. True claims are timeless. And this would be why we are comfortable asserting them across what we might think of as historicist boundaries. I should just underline that in these cases, the eternal or timeless quality is irrespective of the temporal details within the claim itself. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to shift a little. <laughs> Here today I want to add the importance of a different sort of wide temporal claim, namely the historical generalization, which is used by all of our authors, albeit to varying extents. These make claims meant to extend through time, possibly through all historical time. In Catherine Macaulay's discussion of the death of a steward heir to the throne in the early 17th century, uh, she makes this statement, and I quote, a martial monarch is always dangerous to the liberties of a commonwealth. Now this is a present tense claim, but it is more importantly a permanent claim, apparently good for all time. It adorns what it describes by revealing it and linking it to other potential instances. Uh, there are various logical ways of thinking of generalizations, but the temporal way of thinking of them is crucial too. Something that is always the case shades and manages instances that are only the case once. I mean, that's how a generalization sort of works. So in this case, Macaulay claimed that the death of the Prince of Wales, whose loss was popularly lamented, was not as desperate as people then felt because her generalization held. He liked war, and war was always bad for the country, or at least the people's freedom. Um, yeah. This could be an inductive claim instead of a, but I don't think, yeah, I don't think it matters. Okay, so both these sorts of claims seem to me to be timeless in their truth's ambition, even if we might wonder at them. They may be wrong, and historians might be well advised to avoid the generalizations, 
But if, more importantly, I'm correct, there are several quite diverse temporalities at work in some pretty standard, often banal, historical writing. Between claims of the passing present and attributions of eternal validity, there is still a lot of room for what we might call pasts interactive, the way that things seemingly of different times coexist and interact. Obviously, Kozelik initiated a lot of thinking on versions um, of things that are similar to this in, in some respect. Okay, so in the next section, I'd like to highlight further the variety of times often at play in historical work. And this bit is called uh, Temporal Ontology and Quanta. So one of the classical tags about time is that it is, as it were, a measurement of motion or of change. It is therefore also involved with endurance and continuity. There are a variety of ways that this is manifested, but I think we should consider all ways under the rubric of temporal ontology. What is most crucial is perhaps the way that different things, including persons, ideas, and events, always bring with them, within historiographical writing, within the world, a temporal field, or a temporal weight, or their amount of time, or their possible locations in time, something like their chronological expanse. So I will call this their temporal quanta, but temporal extent might be good uh, or better. Some temporal extents are made within the history and then deployed further on within it. The habit in enlightenment and in ancient historiography of marking deaths with little summary evaluations is a notable form of this. So Macaulay pauses briefly to write, and I quote, Richard Bancroft, the great persecutor of the Puritans, died soon after. He had carried violence to such a length that the number of families uh, which determined to seek refuge in Virginia were numerous enough to cause jealousy of their power in that colony. End of quotation. Bancroft is done. Um, not dead, but he could be, continue to be referred to and elicit both attitudes and a temporal time and span later on. And indeed, Macaulay reuses him um, in the book after his death as a touchstone. It is easy to see this with people who can have showy and decisive beginnings, middles, and thumping ends, but it is in fact ubiquitous. Consider this sentence of Peter Brown's. The arrival of the Arabs merely cut the last threads that had bound the provincials of the Near East to the Roman Empire. I guess that's two sentences. In the Arab Empire, nobody was a citizen, citizen in quotation marks, in the classical sense. And okay, so the arrival of the Arabs merely cut the last threads that had bound the provincials of the Near East to the Roman Empire. In the Arab Empire, nobody was a citizen in the classical sense. The concepts or terms Arabs, Provincials, Near East, Roman Empire, Citizen, and Classical Sense, all I'm saying have temporal extensions and uh, come with some kind of boundaries around that. Um, uh, by the way, arrival, cut, bound, and last might have a claim to be sort of timeless terms, um, able to move across any temporal boundary, at least as we deploy them. So Brown is, in fact, particularly playing with them here to shape, change, and explain the emergence of a new or at least different cultural domain. Historians like us, like all of us, are constantly doing this, and it is, of course, unavoidable since language has planted the terms in our minds to start with. Even in the geographical terms, we can feel temporal limits and boundaries, tolerances and transitions. Some terms are very anodyne, or were, like Near East, although it now has an archaic and even impolitic touch. The Isle of Wight, um, which is one that Bede mentions, uh, is of course a translation um, from, uh, from the Latin back to the English, or from, in my use, and few of us probably feel anger about it or the displaced Celts who had lived there and had called it something else. So it is somewhat out of time itself and probably how we read it. Roman Empire is clearer, even if it is one of the most ambiguous of entities in both time and space. Bede more than once used the phrase uh, idolatrous worship, and I think we might feel its temporal edges. Modernity has done things to idolatrous worship and its temporality. This is why some phrases feel off and anachronistic. 
So 14th century Quebecois, 21st century German potentate, and Joan of Arc's Tesla cause problems. Like they seem metaphorical because we can feel boundaries of the terms there. I only put this part in after Franz chased me and made me feel like I was entirely wrong about this, so I was looking for something to make me feel better. And Joan of Arc's Tesla is the one. Um, <clears throat> whereas Joan of Arc's carbon footprint, German potentate, and Quebecois poutine do not cause any problems, at least not in the same way. Behind these entities and their temporal quanta is the very question of effective historical synchronization and cohabitation of historical entities. These things and concepts carry their own temporal displacement. At the least, our sense of a term's temporal quantum is part of its semantic connotation and I think of the, th and I think of the thing's causal capacity. Okay, let's press into these variable temporal spans and weights a bit more. The historian in managing temporally extensive entities can change them or create new ones, although this probably takes some argument or at least persistence. Terms without a clear temporal quantum seem to participate in a universal or timeless zone, and this is rather important because they are terms with which the historian might be said to have a special or different relationship in a somewhat different and much lower key mode than Macaulay's generalizations, such terms allow an easy slide across times, that of the historian, of the reader, and of the past itself. It might be useful to add at this point that what I am seeing or suggesting is that we have in the temporal quantum of the different terms and concepts or entities deployed by the historian material that exists in a potentially wide variety of temporalities that is then embedded in sentences and narratives with which we form those truth claims, which themselves then carry a timeless um, uh, element. Uh, this would suggest that some of the concepts are time traveling, but somehow contained as well in a parallel process of sorts in the universal dress of timeless truths. All right. Uh, next section, uh, counting time and making periods. Uh, before moving to conclude by considering further the interaction of the different elements of historiographical time, we should finally say something about chronology and the issues of dates that for so many non-professionals are the bane and core of history. The identification of history with dates and chronology is a long-standing trope and some scholars have found the force of modern times somehow detrimental to the practice of history with supposed connections to ideas like progress. Two quite distinct, although potentially fusible things are referred to under chronology, at least by me here. First, there is the order of things in time, the order, as it were, of events, possibly the order of narration. Secondly, there is the means of marking and measuring time itself, upon which historians plot the people and events of their studies. Some of the most fraught discussions about time emerge from the sense that the marking of time can become a dominant element within our conceiving of time. Um, so calendar dominates. Nevertheless, I don't assume that connection here. Time periods and time can become, however, their own substantive temporal elements. And indeed, much of the development of historiography is inflected by this. It is no surprise that historians often find the calendar a useful ordering mechanism. It offers analytical and critical possibilities. It allows the temporal quanta to be marked and correlated and most importantly remembered. The mathematical character of calendars, especially the sorts that count years in a continuous way, encourage collation of events. Peter Brown's essay, uh, includes as an appendix the sort of parallel lives timeline. This is very, mer I don't know if you can see that, but I don't know why, but he has it here. Um, to illustrate the concurrence of events and their comparison across three geographical, actually like four cultural zones on which he worked. And obviously this is you know, a familiar thing from the 18th century. Catherine Macaulay surely had some significant thoughts about the tra trajectory of English history, if not quite its inevitability, 
But the calendar and what we might call digital temporality, the precision of years, had little part in her narrative. What she does show is her organizational structure according to a sequence of years um, sorry, and sources that themselves were highly inflected by uh, the calendar. With a touch of the medieval chronicle, she comments on 1607-8 saying, and I quote, the remainder of the year and the following is barren of all memorable events. Um, end of quotation. It's actually fascinating because she has an appendix uh, with all the statutes of parliament passed that she doesn't consider irrelevant. It's actually really a, it was very useful for me to see that. Anyhow, uh, this is the tug of analytic organization. Often Macaulay is following the parliamentary records and their seedings and trying to correlate them to the Anno Domini. Um, she betrays this structure further by the way, or uses it maybe, by the way that she typically notes in the marginalia the relevant year. So the extrinsic character of this abstract chronology seems an important part of it. It hardly constrains her, in other words, it just allows things to be marked. Macaulay can help us to notice intrinsic chronology as well what we might call the temporal order preserved in the narration. Under the marginal date of 1618, she writes, but without any uh, determinate chronology, the following, and I quote this. Um, the, the council was now brought to an entire approbation of the Spanish match, and Sir John Digby, by commission under the Great Seal, was authorized to treat and conclude the marriage. Sarmiento had been recalled to Spain to give an account of his negotiation. That court was so pleased with his conduct in procuring Raleigh's death that they gratified him with the title of Count Gondomar and sent him back with powers to carry on the negotiation. So the narrative sequence seems clear, marks some sort of temporal sequence, and this is perhaps most common in history is the way that we proceed, but it actually is lacking any particularity of clock or anything like that. That is the order of time, the narration order provides the temporal structure. And we don't know if we went and looked if she's sorted the timing in different ways as she may have had to for you know, other reasons. Now hidden amidst our four authors, and I see I'm getting to my time, is one, of, one for whom the status of time itself was utterly fundamental. Bede was not only the greatest of early English historians, not a crowded field, but influential, even decisive in European history for the advancement of parsing, measuring, and calculating time. It was mathematical, complex, and substantive because the annual dating of Easter was at stake. Now, um, there's no doubt that Bede would have loved uh, an old IBM computer to do his work on. In the introduction of the brief on times, he noted, and I quote, that time reckoning depends partly on nature and partly on authority or on custom. For example, um, that the, on, sorry, on nature, for example, that the common lunar year has 12 lunar months. On custom, for example, that the months are computed at 30 days. And on authority, for example, that the week consists of seven days. Bede does clearly hold that the connection between history and the reckoning of time is close. So you could have it just being something that's measuring on the outside, and Bede, it's, it's more complicated than that, and I can't pretend I fully understand it. But it is a notable uh, feature of his book on the reckoning of time that in chapter 66, after he started out telling you, um, you know, what a moment was, um, moving up to what a day is, all these descriptions. After 65 chapters of that, he starts to, he breaks into a, a brief chronicle of the world. Right? So in the flowing of the dating, events somehow are in on it. And I think it must be because Easter is actually an event of significance, and maybe not easy for us to see, that anchors the whole calendar. So the whole thing does, in a way, um, tend to take up action, not to be an empty um, Newtonian, as people sometimes say, calendar. Uh, so, um, calendrical time is in this sense not wholly empty. First, uh, it is worth pointing out that using a numerical system for marking years allows the writer to do the opposite of what Macaulay and many early chroniclers did. They didn't, didn't need to enter, nothing happened. Uh, leaving years empty or unmentioned does the same, and that is part of the advantage of the model. 
I still have to show you this, as this page from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle shows, uh, different writers dealt with this in different ways. So this guy has actually written in all the years where they don't know anything, he's written the year in, and then moved on, written the next year, and the next year, and the next year with nothing in them. And most people just skip, even in this period they skip, but something else might be going on in, in some minds. So at the end of Bede's Chronicle, he has entries for several years, um, but with the years skipped in the middle. So again, the fact of the mathematics of it themselves, just the counting, allows you to skip things uh, without having the empty pieces bear on the histories that you might want to tell. Calendrical time is a structure, uh, but not a straitjacket then. Okay, I will skip a little. Um, B does afford us, however, two larger points about time and historians. The emergence of the chronicle arises as Bede moves to talk about the six ages of the world. So he proceeds for 62 chapters on one path, and then there's an Easter variation, and then he starts talking about the ages of humanity. He reckons these as eight in number, six of which are of this world, and I suppose that are susceptible of having a, a history. The sixth age started with the coming of Christ. So we have here distinct eras. Most of the ages are marked by striking events to start and conclude them, like the flood or Christ's coming, as I said. But it's much less obvious how this is imagined to affect what we might call the regular run of events within a particular age. The church is, of course, a thing now and a growing thing, and that's what Bede's story is about. Um, but the age's completion will certainly un utter, usher in the end times and prepare for the celestial ages, but Bede is a firm skeptic about these developmental stages being ones that can be discerned by signs or by the very sort of computus, the calculation that he's doing. Um, uh, there's no way to calculate it and predict when the end will come. Like St. Augustine, Bede discouraged speculation about its end. Uh, he writes, the sixth age, which is now in progress, is not fixed according to any sequence of generations or times, but like senility, this will come to an end in the death of the world. Perhaps a particularly striking case of the combination of periodization with temporal creation is Peter Brown's casting of the world of late antiquity. The entire book is, like Burkhardt's Renaissance, a strong interpretation and configuration of many moments and incidents within a rough but clear time extension, so convincing or provoking that afterwards readers and scholars came to accept the interpretation as an entity of importance itself, uh, more than it had been. So in a way I would say it went from being just a period temporal marker of late antiquity to becoming then a cultural zone, um, which uh, meant there's a lot more study uh, followed from it, which Oops, we can see here. So the book comes out here. Um, so in the English use of the words late antiquity, that's what happened afterwards. So now it's a field, we want to hire people in it. It's a good, happy field. It's not a dark, dumb, bad field. So that's what happens after in this book, um, which itself uh, kind of makes and transforms it into something else. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of issues with engrams, but there you go. Um, okay, so I need, know I need to come to my conclusion. Um, yes, so I have a bunch here on Carlisle and ages, but I'm going to skip that and just bring up some concluding thoughts that are really around the play of historical times. Um, so I had hoped <laughs> that I might now have shown you some passages, and I took some out from Macaulay, in which I could use different colors and shapes uh, to try to show you my sense of what kinds of different temporal actions and spaces are occurring in any paragraph. And I feel like you can do this in any paragraph of historical prose, uh, but I ran afoul of time and uh, lack of inventiveness on my part to figure out how to do it. But it does seem to me fruitful to think on the micro level of historical terms, sentences and paragraphs, to think of how time is understood through history and then in historiography. And what I'm saying we'll find is multiple kinds of time because the concepts um, and actions themselves have temporalities and we play with those as we proceed. The place that examining historical writing has brought us 
affirms the strong sense that there's a great deal of temporal action and commitment in historical writing and thinking. Within the much discussed frameworks of historical narration and the large issue of historical argument, I think we can see several different always active features. First, there is the basic framework of temporal language, the use of the tenses to create the past and its internal relations, the use of all the small words of relationship, proximity, and presence to indicate or suggest temporal locations that are fundamental and quite subtle and able to produce a great variety and nuance of meaning. Then I suggest that these small, crucial temporal mechanics need to be lined up next to some perhaps more controversial ideas um, that many historical claims, including often our summary or abstract claims, but what we find are meant to distribute over a considerable variety of cases and instances. The strongest of such claims would be something like historical or human generalizations. They might be inductive maxims or they might be brought in as deductive maxims, but they draw particulars into larger time frames, even law-like claims, and, and transmit themselves across time. Right? To this, I added the more controversial, I think, idea perhaps that the historian's truthful assertions and descriptions are eternal or timeless claims. While there is a strong philosophical support for such views, I add here something else, which I would apply both to the generalizations above um, as a subspecies and these timeless claims as well. This is the idea that the historian's willingness to make such claims explains part of how and why we can extend our views into the past without feeling that we are violating the past's own character. Um, can true claims be anachronistically held, I guess, then, is the question. And I think maybe not. The time, mob the time mobile or the time mobile, I'm not sure what that is, the time or universal quality of such claims, time mobile, I see, of such claims helps to open up the idea that the contents of history and historical language are themselves made out of timely things and concepts. Some of these might be or are understood as universal, able to participate in all time periods like numbers, perhaps, or fundamental qualities or those anthropological constants of Kozelix, but most others would have at the moment their particular temporal extent or quantum. A basic historical description, even more a passage of analysis, would have to engage with and deploy a considerable host of temporally divergent but generally overlapping entities and concepts. The function, in a way, of chronologies and calendrical elements is to police and experiment with these boundaries. This should not sound static in any way. The bottom line of historical work is probably the way historical work, connecting as it does to the past, constantly and near now inevitably loops back and changes both past and present, creating new entities, changing their temporal scope and temporal relation with other notions, some still with us, some more of the past, which seem to be the most exciting and important work that historians do. Thank you.